hearings, final round and final hearing of public hearings, first six rounds first of public hearings, hearings of public explore hearings, instances of misconduct by financial, financial services, by energy services and conduct that fell and below the community standards and expectations and expectations. This round is different. This round is different. Our focus is not Our on identifying on early clients as of misconduct. Of misconduct. Our focus is on Our understanding on why misconduct why has occurred. Misconduct has occurred. And on what we have done future misconduct. Future misconduct. The misconduct that the has been acknowledged and acknowledged during the work of the Commission, the of the commission the foundation, the foundation from round of from public which this round will public hearings proceed. Our work in the public hearings work in today, the public hearings today, today will have proceeded case by way of case study. It was not possible. financial services entities that may have amounted to misconduct or conduct that fell below community standards and expectations. A great deal of further misconduct and conduct that fell below community standards and expectations was acknowledged in submissions to the Commission, including those received in January and February at the start of the Commission's work. These submissions are now available on the Commission's website. Throughout the year, we selected particular case studies to be the subject of public hearings. Those case studies were selected because they allowed identification and exploration of broader issues. After each round of public hearings, the Commission received submissions about what those case studies showed, both in respect of the particular conduct that was examined and the broader issues raised by that conduct. Commissioner, in your interim report, you identified particular issues and policy questions that arose from the case studies examined in the first four rounds of public hearings. Submissions were invited in response to these issues and policy questions. Following the fifth and sixth round of public hearings, submissions and policy questions arose from the case studies in those hearings were also invited. The Commission received a very large number of policy submissions in response to those invitations. Close to 2,000 policy submissions were received in total. The submissions came from financial services entities, consumer advocacy groups, regulators, government, academics, industry organisations, community organisations and members of the public. We'll say more about these policy submissions later. Throughout the year, many financial services entities have offered public apologies or expressions of regret for conduct that's been examined by this Commission and other acknowledged misconduct. Those sentiments have often been accompanied by promises that the entity will do better in the future. They have sometimes been accompanied by announcements about changes to the entity's product offering, structure or business practices. The purpose of this round of hearings is not to hear further apologies or expressions of regret. We do not think that will assist you in fulfilling your task. As I've said, these hearings are focused on seeking to understand two things. The first is what caused the conduct that has been examined. Put simply, why did these things happen? Was it because of particular practices of financial services entities, such as their risk management, recruitment or remuneration practices? Was it because of the culture of financial services entities or their governance practices? Was it because of practices common to the financial services industry or to specific parts of that industry. The second thing we are seeking to understand is what can be done to prevent misconduct in the future. Of course, our exploration of ways to prevent misconduct must be informed by our understanding of what has caused misconduct in the past. Are changes needed to the culture of financial services entities or to the way they manage risks or remunerate their staff and executives? Are new accountability structures needed? Should the law be changed? If so, how should it be changed? Do the practices of regulators need to change? Do we need new mechanisms for oversight of our regulators? 
Are there barriers or impediments to financial services entities and regulators improving their own practices? If so, how can those barriers be removed? It is to questions like these that we will direct our attention in this round of hearings. As we've noted throughout the year, in addition to the public hearings, a great deal of the Commission's work is conducted outside of the hearings. For example, before each round of hearings, the Commission has consulted with experts and stakeholders, created and commissioned research papers, and received and reviewed large numbers of documents from financial services entities, from regulators, from consumer agencies, and from members of the public. This round is no different. The public hearings that will take place over the next two weeks represent only a portion of the Commission's work on the issues that we'll be examining. The work that has been undertaken in preparation for this round of hearings has included consideration of international experiences, practices and reforms. The Commission has examined a range of relevant overseas developments. We've consulted with a number of experts, including academics, regulators and industry participants in other jurisdictions, including the United States, the United Kingdom and the Netherlands. The Commission has also reviewed a wide range of international publications relevant to the policy issues that have arisen during the year. Those publications included academic research, reports of overseas and transnational bodies, and regulatory guidelines and evaluations. As with each previous round of hearings, the Commission has also consulted with various stakeholders within Australia, including academics and former and current industry participants. The Commission has published two papers on its website ahead of this round of hearings. The first is a background paper dealing with selected aspects of the regulation of financial services in other jurisdictions. This paper helps place Australia's current regime and potential reform proposals in an international context. The second is a research paper dealing with conflicts of interest and disclosure. This research paper helps inform consideration of these important areas which have been recurring themes throughout the Commission's work. As we've mentioned, the Commission has received a large number of policy submissions. More than 1,000 submissions were received in response to the interim report and hundreds of policy submissions were received in response to each of the fifth and sixth rounds of hearings. Each of those submissions has been read and considered. They have informed the planning of and preparation for this round of hearings. They will continue to be considered in the Commission's work after the public hearings are complete. Across the submissions, there is considerable divergence in views about the need for reform and the manner in which any reform should occur. However, there are a number of areas in which there was substantial agreement, and we wish to highlight 10 particular examples of this. First, there was widespread support for simplification of the law. A large number of submissions suggested that current laws and regulations could be simplified or clarified to at least some extent. Some submissions suggested that the current level of complexity causes difficulties in risk management, compliance and enforcement. <coughs> that said, some submissions said that significant change would bring its own costs and disadvantages, including a period of uncertainty until the application of the new laws had been tested. Second, there was substantial agreement that the duty owed by a mortgage broker to their clients would benefit from clarification. Views were divided about the precise ways in which the duty should be clarified. Third, there was very strong support for ending grandfathered commission payments to financial advisers and from superannuation accounts. Each of the major banks has already announced steps to reduce or eliminate payments of grandfathered commissions in their financial advice businesses. Each of them, along with other industry participants, supports legislation to repeal the grandfathering provisions under the Corporations Act. 
Of the industry submissions received by the Commission, only the Association of Financial Advisers was wholly opposed to ending grandfathered commissions. Fourth, there was broad support for further simplification of disclosure requirements. Some submissions suggested that the current extensive and complex disclosure requirements may make it difficult for consumers to properly understand the disclosure made to them. However, some consumer groups warned that simplification should not result in consumer protections being watered down. Some consumer groups also emphasised that disclosure alone would not prevent most of the types of misconduct examined by the Commission. Fifth, there was strong support across the major banks for a number of measures to assist those in regional and remote areas and to improve the accessibility of banking services. These included use of dedicated staff to assist Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander customers, ceasing any practice of charging a dishonour fee on a no fee or low fee account, ceasing the practice of charging default interest on loans in drought declared areas or in areas where some other natural disaster had occurred, and introducing a national farm debt mediation scheme. As the Commission has heard, farm debt mediation schemes, which require banks and other creditors to offer mediation to farmers before taking enforcement action against farm property, already exist in New South Wales, Queensland and Victoria. There was widespread support for a national scheme to be modelled on the existing New South Wales scheme, although some suggested that creating a national system would offer an opportunity to identify the best practice components of the existing acts and consider alternative approaches. Sixth, among the entities that made submissions about funeral insurance, there was almost universal support to bring expenses only funeral insurance within Chapter 7 of the Corporations Act and the consumer protection provisions under Division 2 of Part 2 of the ASIC Act. Seventh, there was widespread support for legislative changes to impose civil penalties for a breach of the requirements in the CIS Act that the trustee of a superannuation fund or directors of the trustee perform their duties and exercise their powers in the best interests of beneficiaries. Eighth, there was support from several major banks and industry groups for certain forms of add-on insurance to be sold only through a deferred sales model. Ninth, there was broad support for extending the unfair contracts terms provisions to insurance contracts, including from ASIC, a number of consumer bodies and most insurers. Tenth, there was substantial support for the introduction of a compensation scheme of last resort which would provide compensation where consumers had a valid claim against a financial services provider but could not get the claim paid, for example, because an advice firm had become insolvent. We now say something about the witnesses selected to appear during this round of public hearings. It is not possible to call executives from every entity that has been the subject of a case study in the Commission's public hearings. As a result, the Commission will call a selection of representatives from a selection of entities. The Commission will hear evidence from the Chief Executive Officers of each of the major banks. Shane Elliott from ANZ, Matthew Coman from CBA, Andrew Thorburn from NAB and Brian Hartzer from Westpac. These four institutions hold approximately three quarters of the total assets held by authorised deposit taking institutions in Australia. One way or another, the operations of these institutions affect the lives of most Australians. The leaders of these institutions play a pivotal role in identifying, addressing and preventing misconduct in the Australian financial services industry. The views of these four witnesses will inform the Commission's consideration of policy issues. As the Commission has heard throughout the year, the major banks are not the only important players in the financial 
In recognition of that fact, the Commission will also hear evidence from the leaders of two other significant financial services companies in Australia. Mr Nicholas Moore, the CEO of Macquarie Group, and Mike Wilkins, the acting CEO of AMP. Both of these institutions provide services both directly and indirectly to many Australians. And beyond that, the operations and business models of both these institutions differ in many ways from those of the major banks. These leaders will provide an important additional perspective. The operations of a financial services organisation are not influenced only by the CEO. The board of an institution also plays a pivotal role. The board is responsible for setting the strategic direction of the entity and shapes its governance, culture and accountability structures. In these hearings, we will hear from the chairs of the boards of three major financial institutions. We will call evidence from Catherine Livingston, Chair of the Board of CBA, Ken Henry, Chair of the Board of NAB, and Robert Johansson, Chair of the Board of Bendigo and Adelaide Bank. Finally, the Commission will also hear evidence from the chairs of each of the regulators of the banking, superannuation and financial services industries, James Shipton of ASIC and Wayne Byers of APRA. As we said at the outset, the purpose of calling these witnesses is not to go over old ground or to seek more apologies or expressions of regret. The purpose is to explore the causes of the misconduct examined and acknowledged throughout the year and to explore how similar misconduct can be prevented in future. Commissioner, that concludes our opening statement. The first witness will be Mr Matthew Coman from CBA. Perhaps if we could have a brief adjournment to allow Mr Coman to come into the witness box and his representatives to join us at the bar table. If I come back at what, 10.20? Yes, thank you, Commissioner. 10.20.